so we talked about development in infancy. Now let's roll the dice and move forward into childhood. So what I've done here is I've divided childhood into two main clusters, early childhood and late childhood, based on how different theorists have defined the stages in development and just based on the immense amount of research done in childhood. So in early childhood, we're really talking about the preschool years, everything from roughly age three to roughly age five, six-ish. And these are really the things before formal education has started, or if education has started, it's, it's much more play-based kindergarten education at this point. And so at this point, we're riding tricycles, playing with sock puppets, and enjoying our time. So we've drawn four cards in this stage of development, and let's get to it to see what's going on. Well, one of the cards we've drawn is the card of morality. And this, around age five, is when we first start to develop a moral compass. But this moral compass is, is what Kohlberg described as pre-conventional morality, or the pre-conventional stages of morality. And these were the stages that really looked at wanting to avoid punishment and wanting to gain reward. Technically, stage one is doing things to avoid punishment, and stage two is doing things to gain reward in Kohlberg's mind. And so this is the idea that kids will make decisions based on not wanting to get in trouble with their parents or their teachers or the police, and based on wanting to get attention or toys or sweets out of it. Because at this age, pretty easy to bribe, pretty easy to be like, if you do this, I'll give you this, because they're driven by rewards and punishments. Another card that's drawn at this age is a third stage in Freud's psychosexual development. Rather than oral or anal, this is called the phallic stage. And this is when young people, sometimes early around age three, sometimes later around age seven, become aware of their genitals and become aware of the differences in genitals between different people. So this is when kids want to talk and think and discuss all the time about the differences between penises and vaginas. This is when they want to know who has what or what's going on. And sometimes when kids are a bit late bloomers and they don't understand this till roughly age seven, it can be more awkward because they're just very fascinated by all the time. Now, two thoughts that Freud had about this stage which have not been supported and which are very ill-reputed are the notion of the Oedipus complex and penis envy. In both of these, the notion was that somebody would be able to see someone else's penis and become very jealous of it. In the Oedipus complex, it's the idea that a little boy would notice how large his father's penis was in comparison to his own. He'd become jealous of his father and want to kill him so that he could marry his own mother. In penis envy, it's the idea that little girls would realize they are missing a part and become envious or jealous of boys who have penises. Now, both these have been proven uh, incorrect and we've let them go away by the wayside. That being said, the phallic stage is something where kids tend to notice these about their bodies and they want to explore more about their bodies. And it lines up with Eric Erickson's psychosocial stage of initiation versus guilt. At this stage, social comparisons are happening. Kids are wanting to form friendships at daycare or at preschool. They're wanting to ask kids if they'll play with them on the playground or in the sandbox or ask them if they want to go to their house for a play date. But some kids might feel really confident in approaching others and initiating this, and other kids might become more guilty and shameful or hesitant or shy, and this might become a problem. Some kids might also feel free asking really interesting questions, asking about body parts, for instance, to their teacher or their parents, and they feel comfortable initiating those conversations. Whereas other kids might be more withdrawn and hesitant to bring up anything that they feel awkward about. Being able to initiate and feel proud of yourself is a major milestone in Erickson's view that a lot of us might struggle with at older ages. Importantly, he did say you could always go back and re-resolve that, so then you could flourish and feel good having best friends later on in life. In terms of cognition, lots of really cool stuff happens here. We now move into the stage Piaget called the pre-operational thought stage. And pre-operational thought stage allowed us to master symbols. We understand our one, two, threes and ABCs and what they stand for. We also understand what the fruits and foods represented two slides ago in representing genitalia. Or that a banana could be a toy phone. Or that the body parts on a doll could represent the body parts on us. Or we're able to read maps. Symbolism is a really cool cognitive skill to have. However, our cognition is also limited sometimes. And so there's two things that are really limiting our cognition at this stage. They are egocentrism and centered thinking. Egocentrism is the idea that you can't put yourself in someone else's shoes. 
a very famous experiment to conduct this was called the mountain experiment. So in the mountain experiment, the idea was that you'd have a three-dimensional mountain on a tabletop. And on one side of the mountain, you might have bunnies, and the other side, you might have horses. And you get a child to walk around the mountain, and you ask them questions, and they can remember what's on both sides of the mountains. But now if you get the child to sit on the bunny side, and you're on the horse side, and you say, what can I see right now? The child will tell you that you see whatever they see. They don't understand that you have a different perspective from them. And that's because they're egocentric. Another thing we have to consider is the notion of centered thinking. When kids have to think about something complicated, they can't think about it in two ways at once. They pick one way and they stick with it. And this can really play out in Piaget's tests about conservation of volume, number, and length. So the conservation of volume is the idea that if you were to pour water from one glass to another glass, you're not adding or removing any liquid. But if you pour it into a different shaped glass, it can trick kids into thinking that there's more liquid there. So the experiment tends to start off with two glasses that are the same shape, and you pour the exact same amount of liquid in both. You ask the kid, is there more in this glass, more in that glass, or are they the same? Well, they're the same. Then you take one of those very similar glasses, and you pour the liquid in it into a different shaped glass, usually a taller and thinner glass. Now, no liquid has been added or removed, so now when you show one short glass and one tall glass, they should have the same amount of liquid. But it looks different because the diameter of the glass is different and the height of the glass is different. So now a young child will often report that the tall skinny glass has more liquid, even though you didn't add or remove any. And you'll say, how did more liquid get there? It was the same before. And you pour it back in the shorter glass, they pour it back in the taller glass, and they say, wow, you keep adding and removing. I don't know how it's happening. Now there's more, now there's less. They're violating the assumption of conservation because they're only able to look at the height of the glass and not both the diameter and the height. We also see this with the conservation of numbers. We see this, imagine if you give a child one cookie and you have two cookies for yourself. You might say, hey, you have two and I only have one. That's not fair. Up to a certain age, you can break their cookie in two and then they're satisfied they have two and you have two. Only works till a certain age. And then we see conservation of length. Imagine you had 10 coins, you put them in rows of five, and originally you had the rows spaced out the same. The child would be able to say, yeah, that both rows have the same amount of coins. But then you space out the bottom row, make it more spread out. They will have a hard time paying attention to both um, the number of coins and the, the length. They tend to be hyper-focused on the length. They say, hey, that row has more money in it. Even kids that can count to five, they'll count to five and they'll say, Oh, it still has more. I don't know how, but it still has more because they're so preoccupied with that. And finally, imagine if you have two pencils or two licorice sticks and you line them up so they start and end at the same point, the child will say they're the same length. But then if you slide one forward or slide one backwards so they start and end at different time points, kids can't pay attention to both the starts and the ends and they will say one of them is longer than the other. It's really cool to see how a young child's mind works and how they solve problems and think about these ideas.